everyone. Welcome to our Boston IVF uh, live stream today. My name is Dr. Lauren Murphy. Um, it's great to be with you. Hi, everyone. Looking forward to chatting with you today about fertility uh, here at Boston IVF. Uh, Dr. Lauren Murphy, I'm happy to answer all your questions uh, that you might have about um, anything really fertility related. Um, some thoughts sort of as we get started. Um, you know, I think a lot of uh, patients um, and potential patients often have some questions and anxieties about maybe their first visit um, to the fertility specialist, wondering um, should they go, what might be asked, what are they going to be asked to do. Um, so these are just, you know, some things that um, might be on your mind. Um, and really, you know, any visit with the fertility specialist starts off just like any other visit with um, a, a medical doctor. So we're gonna just first start by getting a little bit of your history and understanding um, something about you um, and your partner, um, if you're coming in with a partner, or um, sort of about the reasons um, that you made your first appointment. And it's just a conversation, um, learning about also what you've been through, what your goals are um, for treatment, potentially family building, future family building, these kinds of things. Um, so, you know, we always start sort of with an open conversation. And then, you know, from there, really what we're doing is, um, you know, having um, uh, talk about what the evaluation steps are. Um, evaluation in, in the landscape of fertility really focuses on, um, you know, hormonal testing, which typically is blood testing. Um, some of it also is um, an evaluation of reproductive organs um, in, in terms of how they look. So doing an ultrasound um, that's going to take a look at the ovaries, um, taking a look at the uterus um, and the fallopian tubes, trying to figure out if they're working as they should, um, if there are any challenges within the uterus um, that we might need to address. Um, as I said, from the hormonal standpoint, on the female side of things, um, really what we're trying to understand is something, typically something about your ovarian reserve. I always tell my patients that ovarian reserve is a little bit of a challenging, um, vague term um, that sort of is an overview of, you know, what is the quantity of eggs in the ovaries, um, a lot or a little, and, um, you know, what does that look like for you, and is it kind of where we would expect it to be, um, given your age, um, or is it different from where we might expect? And also, what other kinds of interpretations might we be able to make? Um, uh, from from those uh, blood tests. So this is sort of the female evaluation of fertility. And then in addition to just basic fertility things that we um, test here, um, as I said, structurally and functionally, we also want to make sure that you're in good shape to have a pregnancy if that's what the goal was for when you came in. So if you are in fact family planning and looking into um, you know, building, your, building your family currently, then we wanna make sure that things like your um, blood work is normal, like blood count, blood type. Um, we wanna make sure that you're immune to all the things we want you to be immune for in pregnancy. So that if you're not, then this is a great opportunity to kind of get you up to speed with things like vaccines and, you know, um, other other sort of prenatal care uh, or uh, rather preconception care that gets you, you know, the most fit, so to speak, to have um, a pregnancy. Um, so we're just joined now actually by Hannah. Thanks so much for writing in Hannah. Um, Hannah's asking about uh, egg freezing. Um, so yeah, let me tell you about that process a little bit. Um, so egg freezing is a great opportunity um, to, to preserve your current fertility um, in the hopes of you utilizing that later if you need to, okay? And so when we talk about an egg freezing consultation, um, we're going to be doing some of the similar things that I was just mentioning to, you know, a sort of family building fertility consultation. 
in which we're going to talk about are you a good candidate for egg freezing based on that thing I was mentioning called ovarian reserve. Um, and to figure that out, again, we're going to want to take a look at blood tests um, that are related to the hormones mostly produced by the ovary and the brain um, that give us a sense of how you might respond to egg freezing. Um, so, you know, with that, um, in, in mind, we can, one, one of the most common questions I should say I get from some of my egg freezing patients is, um, can I look into the process or get information about this process if I have an IUD in place? The answer is yes, absolutely. That IUD can stay in place the entire time we do egg freezing. Um, and this, uh, we're able to do all of our testing in the setting of that IUD being in place. Now, birth control pill is a little bit different or like the Implanon or something like that. These are things that um, ideally we do need to stop uh, to get good, um, reliable testing results and then that you would need to remain off of in the process of egg freezing. But once we do the initial testing, we're gonna have a conversation about, are you a good candidate for egg freezing? Do we think you're gonna get a good number of eggs? Do we think those eggs, given your age, are gonna be at a good and useful quality that will give you some, some assurance of you using those eggs in the future if you ever need it to? Um, and so that's sort of a conversation that we, um, we will go through in more detail and, and have it very specifically tailored to you. Um, you know, and then following that, we'll talk about the process of egg freezing, um, which really is a two-week process um, in which uh, we are giving you stimulating medications um, that are injectable. During that time, we're monitoring you with ultrasound and blood work, hoping to get a really good number of eggs, um, and ultimately um, triggering, uh, preparing you for ovulation. And before you ovulate, we go in and, and retrieve the eggs for you. Um, this, that one day, the egg retrieval day, is the only day off from work um, in an egg freezing process, and um, one in which you need a ride to and from the procedure uh, place. So um, we do egg freezing all the time here, um, and you know I think it's a great and useful tool for a lot of um, a lot of patients. So I'd say if you have um, other questions about it, it'd be great to schedule a consultation for sure. Um, getting to a couple of other questions that are coming through. Um, we have a question um, from Amy um, who asks about um, IUI versus IVF. So thanks for writing in, Amy. Um, great question. So um, IUI um, stands for intrauterine insemination, and that involves um, taking sperm concentrating that down and um, placing that in a tiny little catheter that then gets placed into the uterus and um, uh, at the appropriate time in the menstrual cycle. And ultimately, um, we hope that that sperm meets um, eggs, uh, you know, and we time that either with, um, uh, either with ovulation predictor kits or with monitoring, ultrasound and blood work monitoring in that process. A couple of things are essential for IUI to be an option, and those are open fallopian tubes um, and also good quality sperm, okay? So if neither of those, if one of those things are off, then we're not gonna be able to pursue with good confidence IUI. Um, but certainly IUI um, in general is, a, is um, a good place to start. Um, for many couples, um, certainly um, often a starting point for my same-sex couples um, and, um, and, and is typically sort of on the table for discussion um, uh, for treatment options. And then comparing that with IVF, um, IVF is a process that sort of bypasses um, the fallopian tubes and uh, relies upon trying to sort of most efficiently stimulate the ovaries. Um, and when I say most efficiently, what I mean by that is typically women um, in a given menstrual cycle have many follicles that are growing. Um, and these follicles um, in a normal menstrual cycle, it's typical that you have one or two of the follicles that are gonna grow and develop and release an egg. Um, that same holds true for an IUI cycle where we're hoping that maybe one or two eggs maybe are released and met with sperm um, through the IUI process. 
IVF, on the other hand, tries to make use of all the follicles that are present in an ovary in that current cycle. And so um, we do that by giving you injectable hormones that get lots and lots of follicles to grow. And then instead of allowing those eggs to be released, we go in and retrieve those eggs um, using a little needle vaginally while you're asleep and don't feel anything. Um, and we're able to pull those eggs out, mix those eggs with, um, with sperm um, in a dish and create embryos that are then transferred back to you. So again, IVF is a process that's out of the body um, and then transferring back in an embryo. IUI is a process that happens in the body um, with eggs released in the body and um, sperm in concentration uh, placed at a precise time. Um, another question in here from Rosario um, asking if there's a limit on how long an embryo can be frozen for. So really short answer is no. Um, you know, once cryopreserved, uh, an embryo or an egg uh, should maintain its, um, you know, its quality and its potential um, indefinitely. Okay. Um, you know, there is a with eggs, um, when you go to thaw eggs, there is you know, about a 10% um, risk or so of, of loss of those eggs. So you know, typically we say about 90% survival of eggs going through a freeze and thaw process. For embryos, it's more like 95%. So we do know that there is a small percentage of eggs or embryos that will not survive the process, but those that survive will be maintained at the quality that they were when they were frozen. And that should be maintained indefinitely in the future. Um, another question from Erica um, coming through. Um, do we have experience um, helping women conceive with vaginismus? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have a lot of patients coming in um, with, uh, with various issues of vaginismus some that have tried things like pelvic floor physical therapy, some that have not. Um, and we are able to, you know, in, in all cases, work with you to find the best treatment um, approach for you um, to either, um, you know, potentially consider doing something like an insemination, um, potentially doing, um, going directly to like an IVF scenario, um, sort of avoiding, uh, you know, any sort of penetrative uh, vaginal process um, at the time, you know, that would be uncomfortable for you. So, so certainly we um, work with patients all the time with this issue and with, with excellent success, um, for sure. Um, another question coming in from Stephanie, uh, who says, um, who, or who asks, uh, do we know if insurance covers infertility treatment? Um, that is definitely a complex question, Stephanie. Absolutely, there are many, many insurers who do cover at least some portion, if not all. Um, Massachusetts has a fertility mandate. So if you are employed um, by a Massachusetts-based company, um, typically that company will be offering some kind of fertility coverage. Many, many times, if you have insurance, in fact, almost always if you have insurance, um, the insurance will cover consultations. Um, often they'll cover diagnostic testing. Sometimes they will only cover up to that point. So it really varies based on your insurer. But here at Boston IVF, we have um, many excellent um, financial coordinators to help guide you through the process of um, what does your insurance cover? What do they require for you to get coverage? Um, you know, what are the different ins and outs of all the insurances? Because it is for sure a confusing process, um, definitely complicated, um, but we are well equipped to help you navigate that. And I would say that all of the physicians here um, are like we, you know, no physician here works in a bubble, meaning that we work as a team at Boston IVF um, with our nurses, with our financial coordinators, with our um, front desk, um, with our medical assistants, we really work as a team to understand um, all the components of fertility and infertility, and that always includes finances as well. So we will work with you, um, is I think the, the bottom line to that question. Um, 
So I have another question coming in from Chelsea um, who asks, um, when you have an unsuccessful first round of IVF, is it possible to go on to have better cycles with better number of eggs and embryos? Um, thanks for that question, Chelsea. I think that is something that comes up for a lot of patients. Um, you know, I often talk to my patients about the fact that the first IVF cycle is just as much diagnostic as it is treatment. And so I think as physicians, we really try to do our very best at understanding, um, it, you know, and, and giving you anticipatory guidance as to what can I expect from this first IVF cycle, but it's not always what we expect. And so, um, so sometimes we end up having challenging conversations about maybe how that first cycle didn't go exactly as planned. Um, so to answer your question, um, can that change in future cycles? Absolutely it can. Um, often my colleagues and I will sometimes um, you know, share cases and we'll say, it's just amazing because we could, in, in some cases, we, it's as though you could do the same treatment twice in a row and get completely different results. So, I would say, um, you know, keep up hope. Um, one cycle certainly can feel like a lot to go through, but I would say on average, we have the most success with two to three cycles per patient. Um, and of course, this depends on your testing and how it all panned out, but I would say, you know, it's average to have a couple of cycles to get success. Um, and it's, it's less typical to have great success with a single cycle. Um, another question um, coming in from Brittany is, what are the odds that a day five genetically tested embryo implants? Um, thanks for that question, Brittany. Um, so one thing I want to just mention before answering that is that um, you know genetically tested embryos uh, what she means by that is something called pre-implantation genetic testing. So testing those embryos to see if they are chromosomally normal. If you do this um, with an embryo before you transfer it, then that embryo has a 60% chance of going on to a live birth, okay? I, ha I, I don't know that I can break down for you 100% what the chances of implantation alone are, um, they would be higher than 60%, um, but certainly, um, you know, it's never 100%, but 60% chance per genetically tested embryo to go on for a live birth. Um, another question we have here um, from Laura, um, who's saying that she's thinking about switching to a new clinic um, would you have to have all your rete your testing redone? Um, so, no, um, it, or I should say it depends. Um, if your testing and evaluation was all done within a relatively short time frame, um, say for example, you know, within six months to a year, oftentimes we can use all of that um, and we wouldn't have to redo anything. Sometimes, depending on insurance and different things like that, you may have to repeat testing um, again, just due to the time frame of when it's eligible. And sometimes depending on what the report is, for example, if you're talking about the hysterosalpingogram, which is a dye test where we look at the uterus and the tubes, sometimes um, those tests done at um, outside places, depending on where they were done, um, can be a little bit less clear. So that is one thing that I think is a bit variable between physicians, whether or not they'd want you to have that redone. Um, but overall, I think all of us here at Boston IVF um, take good care to look through what you've had completed in the past, what do you actually need, and order only what you need. Um, another question uh, coming in from Rose um, is, says that uh, your first uh, frozen embryo transfer was unsuccessful. Um, and does, your question is, does the success rate increase with each round? Is the success rate dependent on the grading of the embryos? Um, 
Thanks so much, Rose, for that question. And I'm sorry to hear that that transfer was unsuccessful for you. Um, you know, I know there's so much hope riding on each embryo that's transferred back, and it's really a hard thing to to get that call. Um, but uh, you know, the answer to your question is really each with each transfer, um, each embryo, you know, holds. Um, I would say each cycle holds about the same chances of, of success um, from the standpoint of a single embryo transfer. So what I mean by that is if you get to a blastocyst transfer where you're transferring a day five embryo, um, you know, each time you transfer that embryo, depending on whether or not it's been tested, you may have somewhere between, you know, for an untested embryo, a 40 to 50% um, chance of success, or if it's a tested embryo, a 60 plus percent chance of success, okay? Um, when, we, when we talk about embryos, um, a lot has to do with grading. So, for example, um, you know, a blastocyst um, is an embryo on the fifth or sixth day of its development, typically, and that blastocyst um, gets a stage and two grades, um, a grade for what's called the inner cell mass and something called the outer cell mass. These grades do matter. Um, and so, you know, if we were to select like best to, you know, most favorable to maybe least favorable, um, we're looking at embryos with A grades um, or embryos with A and B grades. Um, and then sort of the least favorable is embryos with C grades. Now, depending on the clinic you've been to, um, they may potentially transfer C-grade embryos, um, or if you've had only a C-grade embryo available at the time of transfer, um, that embryo might have been transferred. Typically at Boston IVF, um, we don't freeze C-grade embryos, um, and we only would transfer something like that if it was the only embryo available. So um, that's just something to know about Boston IVF. But, um, I would certainly remain hopeful. Um, you know, I think every time you have a blastocyst available, you have a good chance of a pregnancy, um, if, that's a, if it's a, you know, a quality blastocyst. Um, certainly the genetic testing piece that we talked about briefly, even a little bit um, before um, with, uh, with Brittany, was that, you know, these, um, Tested embryos, we just know something more about them. And we know that chromosomally normal embryos are the ones that stick and the ones that go on to a live birth, the ones that we want to go on to a live birth. So transfer of a genetically tested embryo is sort of off the bat going to, you know, from a statistical standpoint, give you, um, you know, a potentially higher odds, especially at the, um, at an age of over, you know, certainly over 38, probably over 35. Um, another question um, coming in from Rose. Um, are there any recommendations uh, for IVF in terms of food, juice, exercise, acupuncture, sort of all those associated things? This is a great question, Rose, and I get this question all the time from my patients. I think, you know, one thing that, it, uh, that I find consistent across all my fertility patients is a real desire to do anything um, that they can to really help and support their fertility. And so very common question that I get, um, you know, my answer to my patients is um, it's kind of simple. Um, you know, certainly you want to be your healthy self, okay? Exercise when you can. Um, you know, eat healthful, well-balanced um, meals, um, you know, things in moderation. Um, you know, if, if uh, weight um, tends to be an issue for you, then thinking about weight um, and a small incremental weight loss can be helpful. Um, you know, that being said, I also find that for my fertility patients, there is a tremendous amount of pressure and anxiety that is you're already facing. And so the last thing that I think is helpful for you is being restrictive, you know, in terms of 
all these different things in your life. So my answer to you is there's not any one thing that is sort of an excellent enhancer, but the things that I would reasonably say are good to strive for is, you know, trying to keep your stress level as down as you can be, right? Like surround yourself with friends and family when you can. Try to find those people that are supportive in your life and are going to help bring you up and carry you through this challenging process. Exercise is good for everybody. Eating a healthy diet, you know, fruits, vegetables, all excellent. Avoiding things like herbal stimulants or supplements is ideal unless instructed by your IVF or fertility specialist. Um, many patients I have love acupuncture. I think it's a great um, sort of uh, augmentation um, or, or accompaniment to this process if you like it. Alternatively, if you hate needles, don't do acupuncture. It's not worth it, okay? Um, so it's sort of doing the things that are going to make you feel good at a time in your life that's stressful. Um, and I think that's the biggest, the biggest piece of advice um, in relation to that. Caffeine, you would ask specifically about caffeine, you know, one to two cups a day. That's, you know, advisable now and advisable, like, in pregnancy as well. Um, alcohol consumption during the IVF process, you know, you, uh, you want to obviously avoid it after transfer um, up until, uh, you know, the IVF uh, retrieval. A glass of wine here or there is okay. Um, but, you know, I would never recommend significant, you know, alcohol consumption, smoking, marijuana, anything like that um, during this process. And most of my fertility patients are pretty um, focused on that anyway. So um, hopefully you found that helpful. Um, another question um, coming in uh, from G, um, who said she had an unsuccessful round of IVF and they were told they had great embryos. Um, but that maybe there was an issue with uh, BMI or body mass index um, that I should never have been able to do my retrieval, um, that embryos didn't stick, all of those things. Um, so, gee, I'm so sorry. That sounds like a really uh, difficult and stressful experience for you. Um, you know, weight, um, so your, your end question was, is weight a factor? We know that weight um, can affect fertility. We know that small amounts of weight loss can improve fertility. Um, different clinics have different uh, cutoffs when it comes to specifically IVF um, and fertility assistance, mainly because of an anesthesia risk, okay? So this is a risk of difficulty um, with uh, sedation and, and breathing, okay? Um, which is more of a risk for outpatient centers that don't have the ability to do an emergency intubation where we mechanically help you to breathe if needed, okay? So some of those comments sound like may have been coming from that angle, I don't know. Um, but really when it comes to fertility and, and health and success, um, we do have some data to, to support that weight um, you know, and obesity really can be, um, you know, it increased issues with um, miscarriage rates, um, decreased implantation rates, decreased embryo quality, um, things like that. So unfortunately, there is some truth to that. Now, that does not mean that we aren't helping um, women who have excess weight every single day to conceive a pregnancy, okay? We, we are, in fact, um, and we are having success with that. But I would say that if there were ways that you could help yourself, um, you know, kind of going back to even what we were asked beforehand, it's that, you know, during this process, you want to try to focus on making exercise and healthful eating a priority um, in your life because that is going to help you. Um, so I think the takeaway here is, um, you know, is weight a factor? Yes, weight's a factor. Does that mean that you can't get pregnant at, a, you know, a BMI of 35 or 40, you know, or above? No, um, but it can make things a little bit more challenging. Um, 
uh, note here from Valerie um, that she had success um, with Boston IVF. That's awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. And thank you for sharing that, Valerie. That's so great. Um, question here from, um, from Marilyn. Um, can you do PGS, so that pre-implantation genetic testing, on previously frozen embryos? Great question, Marilyn. Um, yes, you can um, do that. What it requires, though, is thawing those embryos, biopsying the embryos, and then freezing them again. Now, in this process, um, two things are possible. One is that it may, you know, it's sort of another stress on the, uh, small stress on the embryo, and that embryo may not survive that process, okay? That doesn't happen often, but there is a small percent that will not survive that biopsy and, and refreeze. The second thing is that there is um, a, slightly decrease, a slight decrease in implantation potential once an embryo has been thawed, biopsied, and frozen, um, you know, a second time. So while a sort of freshly biopsied and then frozen embryo that comes back as genetically normal, has about a 60% chance of going on to a live birth. An embryo that has to be retested, um, thawed, biopsied, refrozen, and then potentially thawed again for transfer, that embryo has you know about 30% or so chance of going on to a live birth. So it definitely diminishes the potential for implantation. On the other hand, you're confirming you know that you have a good quality embryo. So that's something that um, is sort of a little more of a nuance that you'd want to discuss um, with your uh, doctor. Um, okay, we have another question here from um, Melissa who asks um, about, let's see, frozen embryo transfer with a, a genetically tested normal blastocyst, uh, hormone levels were slow rising, um, and you know, um, it looks like that you're saying that your doctor's concerned about potential for ectopic pregnancy or an abnormal pregnancy. Um, sorry, I'm just reading the rest of your question here. Um, Melissa, I'm so sorry. That's uh, always a challenging situation and um, very anxiety provoking, um, for sure. So I will say um, that, you know, the challenge that we find with these genetically tested embryos is that we want to, um, all of us, we all want to, I think, have a strong belief that, you know, 60% equals somehow 100%, which it, which it doesn't, right? And so I have seen all varieties as your um, doctor is preparing you that, you know, sometimes you can have what's called a biochemical pregnancy from um, a, a chromosomally tested embryo Sometimes um, you can have, uh, you know, uh, an ectopic pregnancy. Um, this is, uh, and this is, sounds like what your doctor is concerned about for you, a potential for ectopic. And the question is, how, do, uh, how does the embryo find its way back into the tube? Um, what are the chances that this happens again? So this doesn't happen often. Um, it's, it happens very infrequently. Um, I'd say, you know, 1% of the time, maybe 1% to 3% of the time. It's pretty rare. Um, but if you can envision the process of placing the embryo, um, we're using a little catheter with a little bit of fluid, um, which is then injected in. And, um, you know, that embryo then doesn't ever stay put exactly where we put it. It actually can travel around in the uterus. Um, and sometimes um, within that fluid, it can float up towards the tube and out the tube, okay? Um, again, we know that this happens. Um, it happens very infrequently. The likelihood that it would happen again following this happening once with a, with a physical embryo transfer is incredibly unlikely, okay? Um, you know, my hope for you, and I'm sure your doctor is doing this, is, you know, following this very closely, um, you know, intervening um, if needed at the earliest point. Sometimes these things just sort of take care of themselves, um, but there's no easy way through it. It is 
it is kind of a, you know, it's day to day, week to week kind of thing. So, um, you know, I, again, I'm sorry you're in that situation, but the likelihood that this would ever happen to you again in the future is very, very small. Um, all right, we have um, another question um, about frozen embryos um, remaining. Um, asking about frozen embryos to be used potentially, uh, like once you've completed your family in the event of um, cancer in the future. So this is from Nicole who um, shared also that she's had some great success with Boston IVF, so I'm so pleased for you, Nicole, that's excellent. Um, and in regards to your question, it's a great question. Um, it's a tricky question. So we are making strides every day regarding stem cell research, cancer treatment, et cetera. Um, certainly we've had in the past 20 years even, um, you know, what are called save your siblings um, being, being uh, born to basically, if you have a child affected by cancer, you know, having a child that then could be like, for example, a bone marrow transplant, um, you know, uh, resource for the other sick child. Like that has happened in the past. It's ethically very tricky. And, um, and in the state alone of Massachusetts even, we have a lot of strict laws on how to use frozen embryos. So right now, as of today, the options for frozen embryos is simply to either you know, keep them frozen um, in the hopes of what you have hoping, that maybe they might be useful one day and that potentially you could use them. I can't guarantee that, I don't know there's nothing currently available in terms of being able to utilize embryos for uh, your own embryos for like say cancer treatment in the future. But um, hugely important is is research in stem in terms of stem cell research. And so one option you always have with embryos is to donate those embryos for stem cell research. Um, these stem cells are being used to um, create treatments for diabetes. Um, we are very actively involved with a company that's working towards that. In fact, um, for type one diabetes, um, you know, they're, they're used to make all kinds of advances in reproductive treatment. So while I don't have that exact answer for you, um, certainly active science is going on every day to try to get to that answer for you. Um, um, Christina, uh, thanks for asking about Instagram. Um, I will share that with um, our team here to see if we can share this video on Instagram. That would be great. Um, and thanks for joining us today. Oh, and I see actually we replied to you too. Perfect. Um, let's see. Um, I just want to take a look. Um, oh, Christine, thank you. Uh, we have a nice comment from Christine. Um, uh, about speaking in a language that people can understand. So I really hope that um, you, you are all sort of finding this um, useful in that way and always happy to break it down even more as needed. And I know all of our doctors here at Boston IVF, um, I think really uh, are really approachable like this. So hopefully um, you'll find the same. Um, a question from Erin um, about uh, IVF procedures um, and where we do them. So it's a great sort of logistics question. Um, Boston IVF has lots of centers. So um, we have uh, sort of our main surgical center is in Waltham. That's where we do the egg retrievals. Um, that's where we do uh, the HSG, the dye test. Um, that's where we do our embryo transfers. The reason that it has to be there is because that's where our lab is. And the lab is where all the embryos are kept, the eggs are kept, all of that stuff. Um, so other things like um, ultrasounds, blood work monitoring, sort of the, the more routine stuff that comes up a little bit more frequently, all of that can be done at any of our satellite offices Monday through Friday. Um, I think some of them even have some weekend hours. Um, but when it comes time to the main procedures, um, if you're in sort of the, you know, Massachusetts, 
um, Rhode Island area, you would be coming to the, the Waltham Surgical Center for those. Um, let's see. Um, oh, awesome. Really nice message from um, Matthew about success um, with, for his family um, through Boston IVF. Matthew, thank you so much. Um, this is great. Um, oh, Christina, thank you <laughs> um, so much for that comment, too. A couple other questions I want to kind of get to. Um, this is great. Um, Ali is asking, do the baseline lab work and ultrasound during the beginning of an active treatment cycle have to be on cycle day three? How long can you be on CoQ10 while preparing for an egg retrieval? So, so great question. So Ali, um, ideally we say day three um, because day three is a part of um, a cycle where, where um, we can really interpret the results. So. It doesn't have to be exactly on day three. We can do testing on day two. We can sometimes even do testing on day four or five, depending on how long your menstrual cycles are. So longer menstrual cycles, we can tend to do early, um, we can tend to do testing a little bit later than day three. But yes, ideally we want day three testing um, because uh, we can interpret this. We know, we know what the different values mean in relation to each other. And this is what is sort of required from an insurance standpoint as well. Um, that being said, we have lots of patients who don't get periods regularly, um, who never get periods ever. Um, and for those patients, we, we will typically bring you in just for what we call random blood work, see where you're at. Um, and sometimes we're right on where we need to be. And sometimes we need to, um, you know, do another, um, do another, test as a follow-up. So um, just something to, uh, to think about. Um, and then CoQ10, um, you know, CoQ10 you can, you can take as long as you want. Um, ideally, you know, a, a month or two um, in advance of, of an IVF cycle is probably the most beneficial. That being said, um, the date on CoQ10 is not tremendous. Um, so I, you know, always tell my patients that it doesn't hurt to take it. Um, but, you know, the data is murky at best. So I, I would say, you know, it's, it's not something to just sort of completely hang your hat on. But if you're taking it, um, you want to, you want to try to take it the right way, which is why you're asking how long in advance, probably a month or two would be ideal. Um, See. Um, question here from um, Brittany who says, um, is, is there any studies done for women who need fertility treatments for their first kid but accidentally get pregnant for their second um, child? Um, it's a great question, Brittany. I don't know of any studies offhand. Um, but I will tell you that um, you know, it depends on the type of fertility. And what I always tell my infertility patients is in almost all cases, you know, it's not that there's 0% chance of conceiving a pregnancy. It's just that that chance per month is quite low. So usually by the time patients are coming to see us, the month to month chance of conceiving is, you know, three to 5% chance per month or less, okay? So, Sometimes um, it happens that, you know, sperm and eggs somehow meet up and, and that second child or future children are born without issue. Sometimes, you know, it's a priming thing. Um, we can, you know, be doing, there are certain medical interventions that we do, like estrogen exposure and um, sometimes the gonadotropins that we use that can kind of... Um, we call it prime the ovaries, prime the endometrium, do things that just kind of get the body more familiar with how it needs to look for a pregnancy. And that can um, be beneficial in the future for, um, you know, uh, for future pregnancies uh, and maybe, you know, acts uh, to improve that opportunity um, in the future. But I don't know any studies for you. It's a great question, though. So thanks for asking. Um, <laughs> 
and, and to, to, you know, to make the point, uh, it, here, Rosari replied, to, was replying to you about having, being told she had block tubes and then having kids, kids in the future. So, right, you know, I think that's a great point, um, Rosario, as well, that, you know, our testing is testing. And no testing is 100%, okay? Um, I think our job as physicians at Boston IVF and any, any physicians, but in the land of fertility, we really have to take into account both what your testing is showing us, but also, you know, what your um, history tells us. And, you know, so we want to take those things into consideration together. And then, you know, a lot of what we're doing is making predictions and dealing with statistics and then tailoring those things to your story. Okay, so, um, you know, we're not always right. We, we want to always be right. We're not always right. Um, but, you know, I think any one of the physicians here at this practice um, really aims to tailor treatment to you and make sure that we are adjusting it and um, you know making it best fit for you. So um, that was a great a great point. Um, you know, I think that. Um, there's a lot of anxieties when it comes to overall fertility and really women's health. And one of the conversations that I have with um, my patients a lot of times is, um, you know, to start off with is just sort of a, a little lesson in female anatomy, female reproduction. Um, because unfortunately, um, the way that you know, maybe just our society, or maybe it's more globally, but like the way that we um, have always sort of faced female medicine and female fertility is sort of cloaked in mystery. And so our goal here at Boston IVF is one, to sort of, you know, shine a light on science and, um, you know, the human body and what we know about reproduction, what we know about female health, and then also to, you know, present to you loud and clear that there's still a lot we don't know, okay? So the science of reproductive medicine in the landscape of all of medicine is probably, you know, really one of the more newer things um, in the last, you know, 50 years that we've been doing. And so while we know so much, um, we are quickly learning more and more every day. Um, prime example of that um, is, you know, to sort of talk about this genetic testing of embryos, which some of you may have um, heard about or be familiar with and we talked about a little bit. You know, that has um, evolved over the last 20 years. It was attempted previously with very different methods at very different times in embryo development. It quickly came out of favor. Then more recently, you know, five, seven years ago, we started doing it again with more precision, better results. And sort of we had a, a big, you know, embracing again of genetic testing. Um, and then, you know, and then again, now we're at a time where we're we're starting to look a little bit more critically at it, not to say that it's not fantastic. It, it can be enormously helpful and enormously important. But we're maybe realizing that there are certain groups of people that it's really excellent for and other groups of people where maybe it's not that helpful for, at least not right away. Um, so that's like a prime example of literally in the past five years, the science has really changed. And so for all of you out there who have, who are maybe on the cusp of just entering um, this world of fertility and fertility treatment, or who have been here for a while, um, you know, you should definitely take um, hope and confidence and encouragement, I hope, in the fact that each day we're learning something new. And um, any of your physicians that you would ever see here at Boston IVF are going to be taking each step of your process and, um, you know, and trying to learn 
about you and about how any new things that are developing in the science world might be applicable to you, okay? And um, so it's, in that way, it's exciting. And in that way, I think it's really hopeful. And um, you know, so I'll just sort of leave it at that. But, um, you know, for, for, um, for anyone out there who's thinking about uh, connecting for purposes of, you know, a conversation, because that's really what any first consultation is, please don't hesitate. We have great doctors here. We can talk to you about fertility preservation, any type of family building. I'm happy to talk to you about other issues like PCOS, management of that. Um, the other thing I don't want to forget to mention, too, is, um, you know, because I think this has kind of come up in, in some of um, uh, some of these scenarios is um, what we have called the DOMAR Center, which is sort of a mind-body center that goes with us in association, um, you know, for uh, helping you through some of these treatment steps. And the Mind Body Center, the Domar Center, is run by Ali Domar, who um, is a clinical psychologist um, and specializes in infertility. She's honestly, she's toured all over the country. She's been on Oprah. She's fantastic. Um, and she, um, she, and and everyone at the Domar Center, you know, their goal is to help walk you through this process and support you through this process. Um, Domar Center offers um, counseling, um, group therapy sessions. Before COVID, they offered you know, yoga stuff. We are still doing acupuncture there. Um, uh, I believe we have some opportunities for massage as well. So, you know, think about that as, as an, a place that you can um, look into as well um, for support. And, um, Oh, I just uh, to jump right back into questions briefly. We have a question um, from Angela um, who asks, "How many rounds should you do? Um, how many rounds should you be done with IVF when you have severe diminished ovarian reserve?" Um, Angela, <clears throat> thank you for that question. And um, you know, it, if if this is on your behalf, um, it's, it's a tough road, and I can imagine that you uh, have felt um, felt that. Um, so uh, thanks for sharing your question. I think um, it's, it's really different for everybody. So for my patients with um, really severely diminished ovarian reserve, um, or even on the border of something that we call um, ovarian failure, it is a tough road. Um, you know, usually we're very, you know, your doctor aware of it sort of before you start the IVF process. Um, usually, I'm preparing my patients for a potentially long haul. Um, the times in which, uh, you know, I think that the short answer is it's, there's no right answer for how many cycles to do. Um, if you are getting embryos, despite really low um, egg yields, um, you know, any kind of viable embryo to transfer, then, you know, I think you could argue that that would be a reason to continue until, you know, either you don't have insurance coverage or it's, you know, really financially maybe not in the best interest to do so. But I think as long as you are having the potential to get embryos, it's, it's certainly worth considering continuing. Also, you know, there are a lot of different... Um, treatment options or, or um, treatment approaches for IVF. And so usually with my patients with, you know, severely diminished ovarian reserve, if we can, I usually want to try at least three cycles um, to see sort of what can we do. Um, you know, I've definitely gotten to points where I've done four or five cycles on patients and it's their very last one that they conceive. So, you know, that, that being said, I will also say um, it is a very emotionally draining process, and it is hard. And um, for patients where I have had some patients who I think have, have really felt like they've just, they just don't want to do it anymore because it's so hard. And um, I understand that. So I think that 
it all depends on your own personal situation and kind of what we're seeing. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of how I would start um, from there. So, um, so anyways, well, thank you so much for joining me today. It's really been, um, uh, actually really fun to answer these questions for you. And, um, you know, we're here for you, um, in whatever capacity you need us. Um, like I said, we do a lot of different things here and never hesitate to schedule a consultation. Um, even if you're not sure exactly what you want to do, uh, I have plenty of patients coming in just for knowledge, fertility consultation, what are my options, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm um, always happy to see you, happy to answer your questions. Um, just give us a call and um, we'll do it for you. Um, Oh, perfect. I got it. One other quick question um, here from Jennifer uh, asking, oh, this is a great question, Jennifer. What are your thoughts on lower dose protocols for diminished ovarian reserve? I love them. Um, I recently have been doing them on the majority of my patients with diminished ovarian reserve um, with really, I think, encouraging results. Um, so usually, usually if I have a patient who's coming in right off the bat with diminished ovarian reserve, I'm not always starting with the low dose protocol. Um, I, if they, if they're a patient who has an option for multiple, you know, possible multiple cycles of IVF, I will typically start with the more traditional kind of maximum dose protocol to see if they'll respond. Um, but if that doesn't yield great results, then I typically will then on my next cycle change over to a low dose uh, protocol. And, you know, we're looking for quality, um, not quantity, but I will say that I have had um, some really good embryo development um, from these cycles. I've, I've done, you know, a couple, like a good handful. I'd say um, so far, and you know, you may be familiar, Jennifer, um, that this came out in a, in a study uh, about a year ago now, um, suggesting that you know d these low dose protocols are at least as successful as um, as the high dose, if not more so. And so, um, I just think they're a little easier for patients, and I think they, I think I've seen a change in the quality. So, I like them. Um, so we're just about out of time. Um, so I, you know, we'll kind of end on that note. Um, but that, actually, that's another perfect example um, that Jennifer brings up of, of new things that are coming out and new research. Um, you know, we are, we are students of science. We are um, practicing physicians because that's what we do. We change our practice based on new data, what we're learning, what we're seeing. Um, so I would just say, if you've been discouraged in the past, um, if you feel like you're not getting what you need or you're on the cusp of this and this is all new, again, just don't hesitate. Just make an appointment. We're always happy to walk you through any of it. Um, that's what we're here for. So um, anyhow, well, I hope you guys all have a great weekend. It's just Thursday. We're almost there. And um, yeah, reach out if you need us, okay? Thanks again for joining.